charge. Um, and then the other is relative abundance of the ions. Okay, so in this example, we're looking at this. Um, this is a marine toxin, neosaxitoxin. Okay, this is its elemental composition. Okay, which gives it a monoisotopic mass of 315.13 daltons. And it appears in the mass spectrum here at 316 mass to charge. And that's because a proton's been added to the neutral molecule to give it a charge. Okay, and we look at mass to charge, so the mass of that entire uh, complex, if you like, of the, the neutral molecule plus the um, proton is 316. Okay, so the other peaks in this spectrum are calibrum peaks, so the other, just, just some other ions in there. Now, if we're comparing the heights, of, you have to be careful when you compare the heights of peaks in mass spectrum because you're comparing the, it's the relative abundance of the ions, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to the relative abundance of the molecules in solution, okay? Because as we will discuss, we're going to ionise the molecules that are in solution and some molecules will ionise better than others. And if they ionise better than others, they're going to appear more abundant in the mass spectrum. So once you've got the ions charged and in the gas phase, then the relative abundance holds, okay? But getting them ionised, there may be some discrepancies between solution and, um, uh, and what you see in the mass spectrum. You know, because on a number of occasions, collaborators have come to me and said, I've got some contaminant in this sample. I don't know what it is, but it's really abundant. It's ruining all my experiments. If you look at it, I know it's going to be the most abundant. It will be the biggest peak that you see in the mass spectrum. And it could very well be hugely problematic and very abundant, but unless it ionises well, it won't necessarily be the biggest peak in the mass spectrum. Okay? It could be any of them. So we have to bear that in mind when we're thinking about... Um, we're thinking about peptides. Okay, so there are two key ionisation techniques that are used in proteomics and actually more generally in biological mass spectrometry. So up until the early 80s, mass spectrometry was really only used, um, was, well, it was really only found in chemistry departments um, as a sort of support for synthetic chemists. So small molecules, I think, I've, I think I've prepared this, measured the mass, yes, it agrees, and confirmation uh, of the synthesis. The limit was really about 2,000 Daltons, okay? So any molecule bigger than 2,000 Daltons, you couldn't really see with mass spectrometry, and, and so it wasn't much use in, for biology, Okay. But then in the mid-80s, these two techniques were developed, electrospray, or ESI, and MOLDI, which stands for Matrix-Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization, and they revolutionised biological mass spectrometry because now we're able to look at very large biomolecules using them. Okay, so that's that limit's taken away, and the field's really taken off since then. Um, and the, the people who developed these two techniques have won the Nobel Prize uh, back in 2003 because it's... Cause it really has revolutionised uh, our, our ability to, to analyse. Right, so they're quite, although, I mean, the two techniques have, have had this great impact, but, um, but they're rather different in their underlying principles. So electrospray involves formation of charged liquid droplets, which are, from which the ions are, are dissolvated or, or desorbed. Um, and the mouldy involves the use of a laser. So a laser is fired at the sample, which is uh, on a, a solid substrate. Okay. So let's look at those individually. So this shows the uh, electrospray process. Right. So your sample, we're talking about proteomics. So our mixture of peptides is in solution. Uh, and they'll be in a solution that comprises water and some organic solvent, so acetonitrile or methanol. So acetonitrile is more commonly used. But, um, and they are being pumped through a capillary, 
and a, a voltage is applied between the capillary and the entrance to the mass spectrometer. Okay. Now, as a sort of consequence of the interplay between the surface tension of the liquid and the uh, electric field that's been applied, this thing called a Taylor cone forms at the uh, exit of the capillary. And at the tip of the Taylor cone, the solvents, um, or the solution, is, is unstable and these droplets form. Okay, so you have droplets that contain your peptides of interest and they're in water and acetonitrile. And the bit I've missed out is that there are, is acid added to the solution as well. So you've got the droplet which has got your peptide in water and acetonitrile and something like formic acid, commonly formic acid, could be acetic acid. Now, when you have a charged sphere, the charge sits on the outside, okay? So you have your, your solvent sphere, charges on the outside, but the solvent is partly organic and so is, um, is evaporating and the droplet gets smaller and smaller. So which means that those charges on the outside are getting closer and closer to each other. And at some point, they reach um, what's uh, the, the Raleigh limit, it's known as that, um, and at that point, a coulombic explosion occurs. So what that means is the charges have got so close to each other that they repel, and then you form two droplets. Okay. And then the same process happens again. Okay. And so you have, you start, you've got a smaller droplet, but still the solvent is evaporating, the droplet's getting smaller, the charges are getting closer and closer together, and then at some point you reach this limit where coulombic explosion occurs and you have another smaller droplet. And the process just goes on and on until what you're left with is your, um, your analytes, so your peptides that you're interested in, and the charge that's on them. Okay, and that's what goes into the uh, mass spectrometer. So when you do electrospray, what you get are multiply charged ions, okay? So you get more than one protein, more than one proton on your peptide. This is a, a photograph of that in action. Now, I have a very, I don't know if this will work. Oh, it does work. This is a bit of a clunky animation that shows the electrospray process. Okay, so the analytes are the coloured squares and circles and what have you, the charges. And you see the droplet, droplet evaporating. So you can see, you see the nitrogen that's being shown here. So this is a, 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 a flow of gas in the opposite direction. That's to help the evaporation process. Okay, it will occur naturally anyway, but um, you can use a... a a, a gas like this to improve the process. Okay, so that's um, electrospray. And then the other technique, which one of you said that you'd used, is mouldy. So mouldy, you have your your sample is on a on a solid substrate. So you've got your peptides. Um, they're embedded within a matrix. Um, and there are various cations. So the matrix is usually an, an acid, so there'll be um, protons within that, um, within that sample spot. And the reason it is a matrix is we're going to fire a laser at the sample, and so the laser light needs to be absorbed. Now, if you're just relying on your analyte, well, you can't just rely on your analyte because it doesn't necessarily absorb laser light at, at the, that particular wavelength. So... The matrix absorbs the laser light, and as a result, it dissolves from the surface of the spot, and in doing so, it drags with it the analyte and the, and the um, cation, so the proton, or, or there could be sodium or lithium if that's uh, in the substrate as well. Okay. So, the, uh, so the analogy is, if you're on the train, right, and it's a very crowded train, and you're surrounded by school kids who all want you to get off at the next stop and the doors open. Now, you don't want to get off at the next stop. You're quite happy on the train, but all these excited school kids are around you and they pull you off the train through the doors. 